Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the HBCU Week panel hosted by the Department of Defense. My name is Dr. Daphne Cherry. By training, I am a biomedical engineer, and I will be facilitating this panel today. I am a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow supporting the Laboratories and Personnel Office in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. This panel, entitled Research Partnerships and Opportunities with the DOD HBCU MI Program and the University Affiliated Research Center's UARCs, will include speakers from the Office of the Secretary of Defense, the research offices from each of the DOD services, and also uh, from the HBCU academic community. The panel, co-organized by myself and my colleague, Dr. Nathan Boyd, under the advisement of Mrs. Evelyn Ken and Dr. Joan Fuller, is intended to provide an opportunity to learn about the department's current engagement with the HBCU community. We hope that attendees find what is discussed here today to be useful, and would like to encourage folks to ask questions in the chat throughout the session. I want to say thank you to you all for being here and to our panelists for volunteering their time to be here to share your expertise with us today. I will now turn it over to your moderator, Dr. Boyd, to give a quick overview of the format of our session today before we start. Great. Thank you, Daphne. Uh, so my name is Dr. Nathaniel Boyd, and I will be moderating the panel today. Uh, by training, I am an immunologist and a cancer biologist, but now I am uh, also, like Daphne, a AAAS uh, science and technology policy transitioning my career into government. Um, I am also in OSD in the same office as uh, Dr. Cherry. Uh, and both, both her and I have an academic background and are relatively new to the government space. So we designed this panel to answer questions that we imagine folks outside of the government sphere would have. So we are really excited to be here um, and learn from our panelists today. We aim for this to be as informative as possible and encourage folks to ask questions in the chat. That being said, we have a very large panel today and have a limited time to get, uh, get everyone's questions in. So I apologize if we cannot um, get everyone's questions, uh, but we will try our best. Uh, so to start, I will introduce each of our speakers today and they will provide a short introduction and background on their area of expertise, how their program relates to the theme of our panel. And after each speaker has given their introduction, uh, we will then move to the second part of our panel, which is Q&A, uh, where we'll ask a mix of prepared questions and questions submitted by the audience. Okay, well, let's get started. Daphne, oh, perfect, great. All right, so our first speaker, uh, Ms. Evelyn Kent, um, I am pleased to introduce her. Uh, she serves in several capacities within our office, uh, the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. She is the DOD Program Director for the Historically Black Colleges and Universities in the Minority Serving Institutions Program, HBCUMI. Uh, in this capacity, she oversees program funds that support basic research, equipment, and instrumentation upgrades, graduate fellowships, scholarships, research and education centers, and other activities that are focused on attracting underrepresented minorities to the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics disciplines that are extremely important to the DOD National Security Mission. Importantly, uh, Ms. Kent represents uh, the DOD on the White House Initiative's executive orders for the HBCU NMIs, and her career spans over 40 years of government service in the information technology, weapons centers acquisition, international affairs, environmental life sciences, and the command control and intelligence environment. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in the mathematics from Southern University Baton Rouge and a Master of Science degree uh, in acquisitions administration from Central Michigan University. She's also a graduate of the Federal Executive uh, Institute Leadership Program in Charlottesville, Virginia. And she's the recipient of the Department of Defense Exceptional Civilian Service Award uh, and also the 20, 2012 Women of Color STEM Career Achievement Award. Ms. Kent, we are so pleased for you to be joining us today. Take it away. All right, Dr. Boyd, thank you so much. First, I would like to say I'm wearing my school color, Southern University, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, we're blue and gold. Go Jaguars, so I have to cheer them on, especially after what they've had to deal with with Ida, right? So you can see Ed, Ed has all of his uh, HBCU uh, dress and, and uniforms and everything behind it. But I just wanted to give a little shout out to uh, Louisiana and ask everyone to keep them in your prayers. So 
Good morning, everyone. Everyone, it is exciting to be here today. I've participated in the uh, White House Initiative, HBCU MI uh, National Conference for several years now. And as the Department of Defense representative for historically Black colleges and universities, this is an important event. I would like to thank our moderators, Drs. Boyd and Cherry, for pulling together this panel. They've done an outstanding job. My presentation will focus on the OSD targeted program. And as Dr. Board said, this program resides under the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Uh, Ms. Heidi Chu is our new political appointee in that position. The program is authorized by 10 U.S.C. 2362. Next slide. And this is our statutory authority. 10 U.S.C. 2362 supports research and educational opportunities for HBCUs and MIs. And it is funded annually through appropriation and it has its own funding program element line within the appropriations for the Department of Defense. I would like to briefly discuss some of our program best practices in regards to research and educational opportunities, outreach, summer internship and faculty fellowships, centers of excellence, funding opportunity awareness, and just to let you know, this program supports more than 700 institutions that can qualify as HBCUs and minority serving institutions on the Department of Education program. First, we'll like to talk about our research and educational opportunities. In the research and engineering office and the laboratories and program office, we fund both grants and cooperative agreements. Our grant awards <clears throat> are funded through research and equipment. Uh, the research awards are for three years and they can range up to about 700K over three years. Our equipment or grants are for one year for 12 months, and they can also range up to now, we're moving the funding up to 700K a year. So we also support centers of excellence, and I will discuss those later. So in regards to our research and educational opportunities, every year we put our funding opportunities in this targeted program, and they're posted on grants.gov for the various uh, opportunities within the Department of Defense. Our partners that work with us, uh, they're our colleagues, our distinguished colleagues that's on this panel, the Army, Navy, and Air Force. We work together as a team uh, to make sure this OSD targeted program not only has the OSD priority focus, but also partner with and leverage funding with our services. In regards to outreach, we have had to, as you're aware, conduct our outreach virtually. Our outreach includes uh, virtual town halls in which we partner with the National Academy of Science in regards to our town halls. Our first town hall was supposed to be the end of this month, September, hosted by Dillard University. However, we will push that one back and we will start our first town hall in October and that notice will go out to everybody. We also, in this virtual environment, conduct webinars. And in conducted webinars, we not only conduct webinars that we discuss our targeted program within r &E, but we also have webinars with our partners, Army, Navy, Air Force, and the defense agencies, where we work together to discuss just the things that we are working on together. In regards to our summer internship and faculty fellowship program, for the last two years, our summer internship program has been virtual, as well as our faculty fellowship program. Our internship program is a 10-week program, whereas we bring in students from HBCUs and MIs, and they are mentored by our DOD laboratory faculties across the nation. So we just finished our uh, 2021 internship program on August 13th. So they're all back to school now and I hope they're doing some great things and we plan to keep in touch with them. Also in regards to our faculty fellows program, one of our colleagues on this panel will discuss a partnership that we have 
uh, established with them in terms of faculty fellows program. Another area that I would like to discuss are our centers of excellence. Our centers of excellence began in 2015. And as of to date, we now have nine centers of excellence. These centers of excellence focus on the Department of Defense modernization priorities, as well as the educational aspect of 10 USC 2362. The centers conduct multidisciplinary collaborative research that attracts early career researchers. I will provide you the nine centers of excellence that we currently fund. Norfolk State University, our cybersecurity center, Autonomy, North Carolina A&T State University, Research Data Analytics, Prairie View A&M University, our Aerospace and Education Research and Innovation Space Center of Excellence is at Tuskegee University. Our Advanced Quantum Sensing is at Delaware State University. And yesterday, President Obama, I mean, President Biden, excuse me, announced that Dr. Tony Allen, the new, the president at Delaware State University, will head up his advisory board and be the chair to him as the HBCU advisor to the president. University of California Riverside is our fully networked command control and communication. Howard University is our artificial intelligence and machine learning. Hampton University is our STEM scholars education center and Spelman College is our STEM scholars, minority women in STEM. So those are our nine centers of excellence. As I said earlier, as far as funding opportunity awareness, I will uh, ask our colleagues on this panel to discuss their centers of excellence. There are several cornerstones in our program that we focus on as far as to increase the number of minorities, graduates in STEM, and to build a more diverse pool of scientists and engineers. And these cornerstones are measure success in open competitions, ensure that HBCUs and MIs are made aware of funding opportunities and other opportunities available to them, familiarize HBCU and MI faculty with the DOD operations, how we do business, and inform and encourage HBCU student participation. And our next slide will be an example of this. Next slide. In our office, the uh, HBCMI program office, under our acting uh, research technologies and laboratories uh, director, Dr. Pamela Potty, uh, the SMART program office and I, we have partnered together uh, in terms of the science, mathematics, and research transformation scholarship program. This came about not only because of section 250 that was enacted in fiscal year 2021, but also because it is important to make sure that the HBCU MI community is aware of the SMART scholarship program. It is a program for service. That means if you work for DOD one year, you have to, uh, if you, receive a scholarship, then you we require to come and work for DOD for a year. I will not go too far into this, just to say you you get full tuition. Look at the great benefits of a SMART Scholars internships. You get a career at the end when you graduate with one of our great Department of Defense laboratories. There are some eligibility and program requirements that you must meet. You must be a US citizen a minimum grade point average of 3.0, a degree in STEM, 18 years or older. You must commit to at least one year. You must be able to obtain a security clearance. This is very important. Complete the internship and accept DOD employment. And if you'd like to know more about the Smart Scholars Program, there's the smartscholarship.org website that you can go to. And please know, I would like our HBCU MI community to know that the application uh, process is open for you to submit applications and compete. It will close in December. So if you have any questions, you can go to that website or any of the other social medias that's below on this slide and reach out to us. 
So next slide, thank you, and my time is up. <laughs> thank you so much, Ms. Kent. Uh, I really appreciate it. So now we'll move on to our next speaker and reminder uh, to hold all your questions to our uh, Q&A. So I imagine you all will have some questions for Ms. Kent. Uh, so please hold on to those tightly. So our next speaker uh, is Dr. Patrice Collins. Um, and Dr. Collins has the distinct recognition as being the first African-American woman graduate from Delaware State University's Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics program. She has served as an assistant professor and deputy director of research for the Mathematical Sciences Center of Excellence at the United States Military Academy in the Department of Mathematical Sciences, where she was an active member of the Center of, for Leadership and Diversity in the Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Her involvement assisted in the development and implementation of various STEM workshops for middle school and high school students across the country. Today, Dr. Collins serves as the Outreach Office Team Lead for the Army Research Laboratory through which she continues her mission to serve her national community throughout, through her outreach efforts. She oversees outreach programs that empower and inspires future national security leaders from middle school all the way to postdoc and mechanisms that assist scientists with building collaborations with academia to foster institutional advancement and build research capacity. Dr. Collins has been recognized for her work in outreach and academics. She has been the recipient of the NSBE Janice A. Lumpkin Educator of the Year Award Minority Access National Role Model Award, and AMP Excellence Award in Engineering and Science Education. Thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Collins, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Boyd, for that introduction. I'm excited to be here today, and I thank the moderators for inviting me to present. I'll be speaking about Army HBCUMI opportunities. I have three major takeaways in my presentation today. Um, the first, where best to engage the Army for s &T. The second, how to engage strategically. And the third is engagement opportunities and mechanisms. So let's start by discussing where best to engage. Next slide, please. The Army has a strategic approach to meet its responsibility as part of the joint force to provide the defense of the United States. There are five science and technology performing organizations. What you can note from this slide is that the majority of the SNT is performed in the Army's Future Command, specifically in the Combat Capabilities Command. The Army established Army's Futures Command in 2018 to realign elements of the modernization enterprise and to bring unity of effort to the future force development process. And I'm gonna focus in on the Combat Capabilities Command um, and the Medical Research Command because those are our heaviest uh, s and organizations. So the Combat Capabilities Command ensures the dominance of Army capabilities by creating, integrating, and delivering technology-enabled solutions to our soldiers. DEVCOM is the Army's organic research and development capability. The Medical Research and Development Command manages and executes research in military infectious diseases, combat casualty care, military operational medicine, chemical biological defense, and clinical and rehabilitative medicine. So question, where do you engage? A good place to start will be with AFC where our s and is the heaviest. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about how to engage strategically. The Army Modernization Strategy is the government document that describes how the Army will transform into a multi-domain force by 2035. The strategy illustrates how Army plans to modernize how we fight, how we win, and who we are. I'm going to focus on what we fight with. The Army developed six modernization priorities, and the Army's Futures Command enables those modernization priorities. Next slide. So these are our six modernization priorities. And again, I'm gonna say hence why AFC is a good place to begin your engagement. These six priorities drive the Army science mission. Army s and maintains focused investments in basic and applied research. The Army executes an investment strategy that delivers underpinning knowledge and technology which addresses the elements of force modernization. To support this effort, the Army is aligning its laboratories to the following priority modernization efforts. Next slide. So these are our modernization efforts. 
Um, so how do you engage strategically? So I ask you to look at your research and determine how you can align your passion and your research to the Army modernization priorities and the priority research areas. Next slide. So now that we've discussed where best to engage and how to engage strategically, let's talk about some of our engagement opportunities and mechanisms. The Army has recently launched two new initiatives for HBCUs and MSIs. The first is the Faculty Immersion Program. The Army was seeking applicants with junior faculty members who are currently performing research in artificial intelligence and machine learning. These two year, this two-year program has three phases and the faculty will spend time at the Army Research Lab followed by time at an R1 institution and complete the program at the faculty's home institution. This opportunity can be found at ongrants.gov. The deadline to submit questions for this opportunity is September 15th and proposal submission is due by October 1st. The second initiative is the XTech, um, the XTech prize competition. And so this is a Shark Tank-like competition. It's also a three-part competition where you submit a concept paper a draft proposal and a full proposal submission. And each of these three parts are part of the competition. Um, our concept paper submission concludes today on September 9th. So hopefully you guys have already seen the uh, advertisement for it and are working towards that. The XTech Prize competition is aimed at engaging HBCUs and MSIs to fund research ideas and highlight opportunities with the Army to tackle our challenges, earn prize money, and network with Army program managers. This is a 5K pool of prize money for the people who actually get through all three parts of our competition. And as you can see, the Army HBCUMI website is coming soon. So for additional information on all of our Army initiatives, I ask you to use the email that you see on your screen. Next slide. The Combat Capabilities Development Command opportunities can be broken into two different categories. One is funding opportunities and the second is teaming opportunities. DevCom's core HBCUMI single investigator basic research program is designed to strategically engage the HBCUMI community and develop partnerships by providing funding. When you look at the second bubble, our list for funding opportunities is set aside for HBCUs and MIs to participate in highly collaborative research through major ARL collaborative research programs, encouraging you to partner with industry. Going down to the lower left corner where we're talking about teaming opportunities, the first is Open Campus. The Open Campus initiative is a collaborator endeavor with the goal of building science and technology ecosystem that will encourage groundbreaking advances in basic and applied research areas. Through Open Campus, DevCom scientists and engineers work collaboratively and side by side with visiting scientists in facilities and as visiting researchers at collaborators institutions. Moving on to the last bubble, the educational outreach program focuses on developing future national security leaders. There are research experiences and opportunities for faculty, students, postdocs, and felt through our fellowship programs, internship programs, and apprenticeship programs. We also do educational partnerships which is a mechanism that allows universities to access DevCom facilities and SMEs to teach classes and sabbatical opportunities. Next slide. So Army engagement opportunities and mechanisms can be found on agency websites. Um, funding opportunities can be found on the agency's broad agency announcements. And so I've listed the three major broad agency announcements that are under DEVCOM. And so I'm just gonna uh, end with some tips for getting funded. Um, Re-RBAAs, familiar so 
self, familiarize yourself with the current opportunities that are available. Be proactive and reach out to the identified POC to begin a dialogue. And don't be afraid to collaborate because often partnering can strengthen your proposal. For any additional information um, regarding the HBCMI initiatives, you can contact my colleagues. Next slide. Dr. Valen Emery or Dr. Pablo Guzman, and their information is there. This concludes my presentation. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much, Dr. Collins. That was great. Um, so our next speaker uh, is Dr. Reginald Williams. Uh, he is the program officer for the Office of Naval Research, Young Investigator Program, the Research Opportunities for Program Officers, the In-House Laboratory Independent Research Program, and the Naval, uh, the Naval Inter Research Enterprise Inter Internship Program for undergraduate and graduate students, and the Science and Engineering Apprenticeship Program for high school students. Uh, he previously managed programs in the Propulsion and Power Engineering Competency at the Naval Air Warfare Center Aircraft Division at Patuxent River, Maryland. His assignments included managing the Small Business Innovation uh, Research Program and the Small Business Technology Transfer Program. Uh, high engine technology demonstrators, and turbine engine analysis. In private industry, Dr. Williams managed technology programs and conducted experimental and computational research in advanced propulsion integration for industrial, commercial, and military applications. Uh, and Dr. Williams received his PhD, MS, and BS in aerospace engineering uh, from the University of Maryland at College Park. Over to you, Dr. Williams. Thank, thank, thank you. Uh... Um, Dr. Boy for the kind introduction and um, thanks everyone for being here today and thank you um, Dr. Boy and Dr. Cherry uh, for being our moderators and for Ms. Kent for inviting me to participate today. Um, I want to um, concentrate uh, my um, presentation um, on two initiatives that we have but um, first I am Reggie Williams, I'm acting director for the Department of the Navy's HBCMI program um, the, uh, our regular director, Captain um, Anthony Smith, is on active duty through um, April of 2022, so I am in his stead until then. Um, just want to um, say quickly that um, under this program, we have opportunity awareness workshops, which we had a originally had a recent one back in um, June 15th and 16th, which I think still is available on the internet. So if you're interested in that, shoot me an email, and we'll give you the, the link to that two day. Um, two-day event. Uh, we also have um, some faculty research programs, um, sabbatical leave program, as well as postdocs. Um, we also have internships across our various SISCOMs within the Navy. And we also started this year a, um, a bridge program where we took high school students graduating and introduced them to a five-week um, intense um, course to learn what it's like to be an undergraduate student in your freshman year. And we also, also within our program, we have funding opportunity announcements, which I'll get into a little bit um, as I speak. Um, I don't have any um, slides other than this uh, intro chart here, so I'll just speak with, to you in the next few minutes. Uh, again, I wanted to address two initiatives that we have ongoing, partnerships with Department of Defense's HBCMI program, that's Ms. Evelyn Kent's office. Uh, and again, the goal behind these programs are to um, provide um, increased research capacity as well as competitiveness at our historically black colleges and universities and minority institutions across the country. Um, our first um, a partnership that we have uh, with the DOD Office of Ms. Kent is our Distinguished Fellowships Program. Um, we kicked it off this year. Um, this is a joint effort um, that provides principals investigators with a full-time salary for three years. Um, this 100% course buyout will enable our PIs to focus exclusively on their DOD um, research. It will allow more time for researchers to write technical papers and abstracts. And this also will increase the number of submitted grant proposals to DOD and other agencies um, as they work on their research, having um, being excused from their coursework. Um, this will permit sufficient time for academic research to engage with Naval scientists and engineers. And again, as I mentioned, we have our summer faculty research program, sabbatical leave. We hope that our um, distinguished fellows will participate in those programs as well. In addition, um, and this will provide each professor who participates in our distinguished fellow program additional opportunities for academic mentorship to undergraduate and graduate students. And one of our metrics we want to see is to increase the number of 
graduating masters and PhD students um, from our HBCU and, 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 and MIs. Um, so we have seen over the years um, from our HBCU and program, um, the teaching institutions, um, HBCMIs are more on the teaching institution end versus the research end. Um, and then we have um, professors who have large academic loads where teaching three, five or more courses a semester on top of trying to do research. Um, as you heard mentioned, I also manage our young investigator program. And I often have professors coming from HPCMI saying they want to submit proposals, but they feel they're not competitive enough on the YIP programs because they don't have the number of publications, they don't have the number of grant awards because they also have a full-time teaching load. Again, this program, Distinguished Fellows Program, is in, in place to help make a balance, if you will, for um, our HPCMI professors to be more competitive with our Young Investigator Program. That includes also our MURI uh, Multidisciplinary multi University Research Initiative and any other um, grant award activities that are out there that would be more competitive with. Um, additionally, um, this can be more significantly more with, with, with their requirements to teach um, at, uh, at a high level as well as do research uh, compared to their counterparts at the larger universities or predominantly white institutions we're hoping to develop a stronger balance between their research as well as the academic requirements and teaching undergraduate and graduate students. Again, this is a three-year program um, for each of the faculty members, a full buyout, so they receive research funding as well as complete buyout for their um, teaching coursework. And um, the, we chose our, um, our participants um, this year out of our normal HPCMI um, Department of the Navy's funding opportunity announcement. Um, so that is a two-stage two process where we have white paper stage followed by a, a full proposal stage. And of those full proposals, we selected six of those to receive this first time Distinguished Fellows Program. Um, and again, we will make an official announcement of the awardees soon. Um, the Chief of Naval Research, where Albo Selby will be sending each of these awardees a special letter saying uh, welcome to the program. Again, this is our first year doing this and we hope that uh, we will see great things from it. Um, I mentioned a few metrics that we're looking for and we're hoping that this opportunity will allow our, our HPCMI professors to compete, um, not amongst themselves um, as well as we always do, but also compete with uh, some of the um, universities outside of the HPCMI community and things like MURIs and YIPs and DURIPs. The second partnership I want to speak with you as well. This again, this is the kickoff um, coming up soon. Uh, we have partnership with um, Ms. Evelyn Kent's office, DOD HPCM office. Um, um, we want to build on the congressional interest to increase funding on, in the Department of Defense's HBCMI program. Uh, we know our HBCUs and MIs represent a resource uh, that could quickly address shortages in the STEM professions, and well as um, strongly impact national security. Um, so these initiatives that these initiatives seek to enhance the HBCMI exposure to Department of Defense um, research activities uh, to elevate HBCUs and MIs to greater levels of defense research. Um, this builds on recent um, HBCMI equipment grant opportunities, as well as the Center of Excellence that you heard Ms. Evelyn Kent speak to earlier, um, where we have focused, where there was focus on um, Center of Excellence focus on training the next generation of STEM professionals. Um, this partnership um, seeks to elevate the Carnegie classification research status of HBCMIs um, from R2 status, which is called high research activity, to the R1 status, which is called very high research activities. Uh, we plan to release a, um, a um, FOA funding opportunity announcement in the coming months, um, exclusive to HBCUs and MIs, with the expectations of funding no more than three H universities over a period of five years uh, to help them attain this R1 status. Again, um, the R1 status, Carnegie R1 status for applicants must show a commitment to doing R&D um, expenditures in science and engineering fields, a commitment to increasing the number of dedicated scientists and engineers with a track record obtaining grant awards at the university, a commitment to the number of doctoral degrees conferred under the Carnegie Mellon 
sorry, Carnegie Mellon, Carnegie um, R1 classification, there is a number of um, PhDs that have to be conferred per year. I think it's like 20, uh, but um, that number has to be maintained. Um, well, finally, there's a, under this classification, um, the ranks is relative. Um, the research activities for doctoral universities under the R1 status is calculated relative to the other universities uh, and in maintaining the R1 status, I call it a contact sport. It will require continued investment by the universities um, in attracting qualified scientists and engineers, uh, receiving grant awards, um, submitting proposal, grant proposals and receiving awards and recruiting um, graduate students as well as producing PhDs. So these are the two um, opportunities that we have um, ongoing with partnerships with the HPCMI office, with DOD HPCMI office, with Ms. Evelyn Kent. Um, again, we're seeking to um, increase the um, uh, research capacities at HPCMIs as well as competitiveness of, you know, of these universities. Again, our Distinguished Fellows um, program um, kicked off this year, and we're about to kick off this Carnegie classification from R1 to R2 set. Um, again, we hope that we receive a number of proposals when we submit this, um, get, get the FOA out on the street. And again, um, our um, Distinguished Fellow Program, again, is based on the Department of the Navy's funding opportunity announcement. Uh, white papers closed for FY22 um, yesterday, September 8th. We're going through the applications, white papers now, and we will select them or those to submit uh, full proposals. Of those who submit a full proposals, we'll reach out and select some of them to participate in the Distinguished Fellows Program in FY22. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this morning, and um, I look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Edward Lee. Uh, he is the Program Coordinator for the Historically Black Colleges and Minority Institutions for the Air Force Office of Scientific Research in Arlington, Virginia. This is one of the nine directorates that comprise the Air Force Research Laboratory. Uh, he is responsible for coordinating activities that provide funding support to minority institutions across the nation. Uh, Mr. Lee provides leadership, strategic direction, and oversight to universities to help them uh, be aware of opportunities and facilitates the introductions and guidance to ensure these institutions of higher education are well represented within the minority community. He has a unique way of communicating, can talk to everyone to make them feel special, from students all the way up to university presidents. Mr. Lee has taken on the task of coordinating activities with the small business programs of Sibur and Sitter, geared towards fostering the commercialization of products to the warfighter for the Department of Defense. Mr. Lee has worked for the Air Force Office of Scientific Research since 1997, initially overseeing the University Research Initiative Program. He is now working to enhance communications between HBCUs and MIs to, to be able to compete for grants and contracts at a larger scale. Uh, his prior experience working in private uh, industry and owning his own business since 1987, EJL Associates, uh, Dr. Lee, uh, Mr. Lee has helped to establish and support black owned businesses in the Washington metropolitan area. He is also a graduate from an HBCU, Morgan State University uh, in Baltimore, Maryland, and in 2013 authored his first book, The Soul of Man. Over to you, Mr. Lee. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Boyd and our moderators for putting on such a, a great event. Again, my name is Edward Lee. I'm the program coordinator and I provide funding opportunities to HBCUs and MSIs across the country. Uh, again, I'm glad to be a part of this conference. As always, it's a, a great thing to be involved in HBCU week activities. Uh, next chart, please. So uh, who are we? We're a small organization with a big mission. We discover, shape and champion basic research. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, we're actually nine laboratories across the Air Force Research Lab Enterprise. Our office is geared towards supporting basic research or 6-1 as we call it. Uh, we have over 200 personnel, scientists and engineers, business professionals at those nine labs across the country. I mean, at our, at our office in Arlington, Virginia, we have over 10,000 employees across the AFRL Enterprise. And again, we are the research arm to the Air Force. Um, we have a global approach as well. We have five international offices in London, uh, Tokyo, Santiago, Chile, 
and just recently uh, another office in South America and we just opened up one in uh, Australia in Melbourne. So we do definitely have a global presence as well as uh, a national presence to attract the HBCU MSI community to do research that's relevant to Air Force needs. Next chart, please. Um, our ecosystem includes lots of people and lots of things. We don't do things in a vacuum. So we're out there on Facebook, LinkedIn, for those who are, you know, sad with social media. So please, you know, like and share, like and share. Uh, again, I provide funding opportunities to minority serving institutions, uh, which includes tribal colleges as well. So again, our ecosystem is pretty large. I'm always looking to, to do a little more. I've been supporting approximately 36 projects a year at about $4.5 million. And just recently, a few months ago, the director, uh, Dr. Sherry Welsh, likes what I do. So she was able to increase my budget by an additional million dollars that was exclusively for HBCUs. So I'm looking at a $5.5 million budget, but I'm also looking to get and involve universities that I've never funded before. As my good friend, Dr. Reggie Williams mentioned earlier, uh, there's always been some, some issues with universities that are focusing on teaching and some smaller liberal arts colleges. But if you're looking to do research, then please you know, look us up. We have an open BAA or Borough Agency announcement, and I'll give you that number. It's uh, F is in Frank, A is in Apple, 9550-21-S is in Sam, dash 0001. That is the first stop for finding out what we're interested in. It's about an 80 page document, has detailed information about all of our 36 technical program officers and subject matter experts. So that's the first stop. See where your interests collide with ours and then you can contact me. Next chart, please. Oh, okay. So uh, just briefly, I wanna mention several programs that I've been engaged in. Uh, one is the Summer Faculty Fellowship Program. We provided funding opportunities this past summer to over 290 people. We had 200 faculty and 90 students and we increased the HBCU in my portion of the Summer Faculty Fellowship Program to minorities to over 46%. So uh, again, we are trying to uh, push to get more HBCUs involved in that laboratory immersion experience. Um, I wanna briefly mention one other program, and that's a program that's being um, sanctioned or managed by my good friend, Ms. Ashley Blackford. It's called the Minority Leaders slash Research Collaboration Program. And that program is geared towards uh, somewhat like a mentor protege uh, setup, where if you're a small school, we can pair you or team you with larger institutions. So collaborations can take place, students exchanges can take place, and the thought process for diverse thinking can take place as well. One of the successes of that program that uh, Ashley has shared with me and I'm sharing with the organization and the group here, just recently there was um, a collaboration with Florida A&M University that partnered with, AM with MIT and FAMU is the lead on that project. And there are quite a few other projects that are being supported by Ashley's group and the team as well. Uh, some new projects at North Carolina A&T, Prairie View, uh, University of Texas El Paso and some other institutions that are fully engaged in this, like I say, collaboration experience. So uh, I'm going to be brief and I'm going to get out the way real quickly. Uh, I'm always looking to add peer reviewers to our solicitation when we are looking for white papers and for proposals. Our poor proposals are peer reviewed. And right now I have a peer review list from minority serving institutions that include HBCUs and tribal colleges. And that list is about a little over 60 evaluators. So if you're looking to be a peer reviewer and provide input from a diverse or minority perspective, 
then please contact me. I'm looking to expand that list of peer reviewers to our minority serving institution uh, community. So with that, I'm going to stop and get out the way. I appreciate your time. And of course, my information will be available for further questions and discussions. Thank you for this opportunity to my moderators, Ms. Kent. Again, thank you. And like we say in the Air Force, over. Thank you so much, Mr. Lee. Okay, uh, so our last panelist, uh, and uh, we're running a little over time, but I promised uh, our, our last panelist, Dr. May, he would get all the time he needed uh, in his eight minutes. So um, I will be quick to introduce him and let him uh, take it away. So Dr. May is VP for Research and Economic Development at Morgan State. Uh, he previously served as U.S. Undersecretary of Commerce for Standards and Technology, uh, and he held le senior leadership positions at NIST and the University of Maryland. He has contributed to over 90 peer review publications and delivered more than 300 invited lectures globally. Dr. May was VP of the International Committee on Weights and Measures and serves on advisory boards for the UK's National Physical Laboratory, China's National Institute for uh, Metrology, and serves on the Consumer Reports Board of Directors. Notable honors include honorary doctorates from Wake Forest and the University of Alabama Huntsville, the American Chemical Society's Distinguished Service in the Advancement of Analytical Chemistry and Career Public Service Awards, the NOB, CC, CHE, Percy, Julian, and Henry Hill Awards, recognized in 2015 as the federal government's top chemist by CNE News and Laboratory Director of the Year by Federal Laboratory Consortium. So we'll end our, uh, we'll end our panelists um, with someone who is from academia to kind of round out um, our panel today. So Dr. May, take it away. Okay, maybe we're having trouble. Dr. May, can you hear me? I'm sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> okay, uh, go ahead. I as I now. said, uh, as uh, our moderator just uh, mentioned, uh, well, I'll slightly correct that. I'm actually a government guy, a 45 year federal government guy who is still in the process after three years of transitioning to be an academician. And there are certain advantages to being uh, in this unique space in that uh, I can sort of adopt the things that I think are favorable and maybe push aside some of those things uh, that perhaps have hindered us in trying to get to where we certainly need to be at Morgan State University. And I, threw, I think throughout academia uh, in general, and I'll share some of those with you. Next slide, please. Now, all the things you just heard Next slide, please. So all the things that, that, that you've heard but uh, are true in a sense, but uh, at heart, I am still that uh, guy that was born in Doja, Alabama. I'm sure all of you heard about it uh, uh, 70 plus years ago, who grew up in housing projects in Birmingham, Alabama who will always be the son of Ruby uh, and Willie uh, E. May and brother, big brother of Montre and Michelle May. Uh, my life was shaped by the events that I witnessed growing up as a part of the civil rights movement. In fact, the gentleman you see in the background is actually my father who, uh, who was the co-owner of a bail bonding company during those dates. Uh, and you finally see that I am the proud husband of Jeannie uh, Tramble May, uh, and the very, very proud father of Eric Germain and Janice Michelle May. Next slide. That's who I really am. I'd like to, as we all know, over time, we in the HBCU community have not really gotten what we feel are the share of our resources. Over the last decade, a little bit more than the last decade, uh, federal funding for uh, predominantly white institutions uh, increased almost 20%. At the same time, support, which was always meager, has gone down for HBCUs by over 20%. So uh, HBCUs get less than 1% of total uh, federal allocation for research. That's a fact. 
Uh, this administration is uh, committed to increasing that, but there are things that we can do as well. So next slide. Uh, and investing in HBCU is a good investment. And we, we, we have a track record of doing more with less. As you see here, about five, we represent 5% oh, or so of all the uh, institutions of higher learning, yet we, uh, we uh, provide over 25% of the bachelor's degrees in STEM. According to the American Institute of Research, about one third of blacks who get PhDs in STEM actually get their undergraduate training for HBCU. So we, 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 we have the pedigree, we have a crack, track record for doing good stuff in this space. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, also, it's not just a fairness issue to invest in HBCUs. In order for us to maintain our global competitiveness as a country, we have to, and I'll put back on my federal government leadership hat now, we really have to invest in these under, uh, appreciated resources so that we can complete globally. Next slide. Uh, one way uh, for us doing this, and this is something that we in the HBC community have not addressed very well, is it uh, being involved with university affiliated research centers. Uh, you see the definition there. These organizations were set up as university partnerships to carry out the work of uh, government, uh, primarily the Department of Defense. So basically, there are a number of universities that basically uh, are, are commissioned to assist in carrying out the work of government. Next slide. Uh, there are 16 of these UARCs. They get around over $2 billion a year of funding each year. And for us at Morgan, uh, we see the benefits to us getting involved in these uh, and let me just go back. Again, these are not grants because grants are basically for capacity building. These are more like contracts. And this is actually to allow us to participate in the work of government. Uh, we see increased uh, Morgan State University involvement in cutting edge research, uh, applied research. Uh, we see increased contractual opportunities access to research facilities that are superior to ours through strategic collaborations within these UARCs, uh, providing us assistance. Uh, well, obviously to do this, we have to increase, improve our business practices. Uh, and we uh, have the opportunity to have strategic collaborations with other R1 institutions of which we expect to be one over the next de decade. Next slide. Uh, here are the uh, UARCs that we have targeted, and I'll speak primarily about our uh, involvement in the Applied Research Laboratory for Intelligence and Security, or ARLIS, uh, that's hosted by the University of Maryland College Park. But we also have uh, involvement and engagements with uh, the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, the Georgia Tech, uh, the Georgia Technology Research Institute, uh, a Penn State Applied uh, Physics Laboratory. Uh, and obviously oh, we are engaged in discussions about this establishment of uh, the HBCU Research Institute uh, uh, that many are talking about. But I'll just say that although, although we plan to pursue the latter, uh, we certainly uh, need to be engaged with these others because quite frankly, uh, this is new to HBCUs, and by participating with these other well-established uh, UARCs, it allows us to sort of stick our head under the hood to exactly see how these things work, both from a technical perspective, but also from a business and financial management perspective. Next slide. So here's the membership of uh, this ARLIS consortium. It's headed by the University of Maryland College Park. As you see, it has three other R1 institutes, institutions as members, Joyce Mason University, uh, Texas A&M University, and the University of Wisconsin. Uh, but we also have three HBCUs. And uh, in addition to us, three HBCUs in the, uh, in the capital region, us, 
uh, UDC and Howard University are also a member of this RLS consortium. Next slide. Uh, you can see some of the work and I have to uh, give a shout out to Ms. Evelyn Kent for making this possible. Uh, there are six discrete uh, projects. She funded some of these about uh, worth $3.6 million that we are involved in uh, on uh, basically an annual basis, at least contract basis, but we expect to finish most of these within the next 18 months. Uh, focus uh, 3.6 million of uh, focus on 5G technologies. Uh, and uh, there are uh, at least 3.6 million total focus on 5G uh, and AI uh, machine learning and data analytics applications. And you see a description uh, and these slides will be available uh, of the types of things we're doing. Uh, next slide, I think maybe a final slide. Okay, I think that's the end of uh, my presentation. And again, uh, the takeaway message is that grants are fine and we will continue to seek those. Those are for capacity building. And in fact, at Morgan, we had a record year in the soliciting and uh, receipt of grants. But more and more, we plan to get involved in the business of government, if you will, and be involved in carrying out the work of government through uh, collaborations through these UARCs and FFRDCs that I, I didn't mention in my talk. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. May. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so we have gone a little bit over, so we have just about five minutes or so for questions. Um, and so we've got a couple from the chat that I will go through. Um, so the first question is for uh, Dr. Williams. Are, are HBCUs in the rdt &E Department of Navy pipelines for R2 and R1 classifications currently being funded and supported by industry and leading R1 universities as subcontractors or DOD's mentor protege programs? Um, can you repeat that? I oh, didn't quite understand what they're asking for there as a long, as a long one. <laughs> I'm not sure I do either. So it sounds like, um, uh, are the uh, HBCUs that are currently being funded, um, are they funded as subcontractors uh, oh. or are they funded through these grant funded like mentor protege programs? Uh, we have a number of HBCUs that are funded directly. Um, as primes on our grant awards. Um, I don't know, I don't believe currently within Office of Naval Research we have any under any contracts, but um, for, for most of the HBCU, HBCUs and MIs as well that we have funded on grant awards, they are the prime on our grant awards. Thank you, Reggie. Um, Nathan, can I jump in for just a minute? I know we only have a couple of minutes. This is Evelyn Kent. Absolutely, okay. go ahead. All right, I'm gonna break in, breaking news. <laughs> no kidding. Immediate release. This is our breaking news for this afternoon. I had to wait until the r &E said I could announce this and it was posted on defense.gov. So the breaking news is immediate release as of September 9th, 2021. DOD launches Centers of Excellence at Historically Black College and University. The Department of Defense through the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering is pleased to announce awards totaling 15 million for historically black colleges and universities to establish centers of excellence in biotechnology and material science. The two awardees are North Carolina A&T State University Center for Biotechnology. Their, partnering, their partner is Wake Forest University. The second awardee is Morgan State University for Material Science. Their partner is Johns Hopkins University. They are both awarded as cooperative agreements. Congratulations to the Department of Defense, North Carolina A&T State and Morgan State. All right, that's the breaking news before we end at 11 a.m., everybody. <laughs> great job, everybody. That's great. Okay, Fantastic. Great, great, uh, great, <laughs> great, great news. That's a great pre birthday present for me. Oh, happy <laughs> birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Happy right, birthday. Everybody. Thank you, Evelyn, for that. And yes, so we are right on time here. So I will hand it over to Daphne to close us out. And thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Daphne and Nathan.
Thank you everyone for joining us today for the DOD hosted panel. We wanna especially thank our panelists and again for volunteering their time and sharing all this knowledge of the various opportunities available to us at the DOD within the services and via UARGS. We wanna thank the organizers of the White House Initiative HBCU Week National Conference for affording us the opportunity to execute this panel for the HBCU community. And again, Mrs. Evelyn Kent and Dr. Joan Fuller for all all of their guidance. We hope that all the knowledge shared today will go to great use. So we did get a few questions asking for a copy of the presentation. We wanna let everyone know that this panel was recorded and will be made available immediately after our session ends and you can access it directly on this, on this page. And I wanna end with this quote that was on Dr. Collins' slides, winning matters, but winning together matters more. Thank you everyone. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.